record button. Hey everybody, welcome to Oregon State University's Permaculture Design Course. This is the summer fall 2023 program and we're into office hour four. Nice to see uh, so many of you still still come to these. That's great. Um, you can add any question you like into the question and answer document uh, as we go along here. So I'm just going to make sure that the link is right. I'm going to put it into the chat. And we've got a few great questions, or you can just uh, raise your hand after I finish the ones that are entered in, and you can just ask it live. So I'm going to share our screen, my screen. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to switch a few things around here. Let's try this again. There we go. Awesome. So we're going to start with Louisa. Um, I'm just going to check and see if Louise is here. Louise Welton. I don't know if this is Louise Welton or if this is the other Louise. Uh, it's two. the other one. It's so the other I'm, one. I'm the, I'm the Brazilian one. She's the Portuguese one. She oh, has the okay. S and I have the Z. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I just looked at your assignment. It was really fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. You're so welcome. Um, so Louisa in Portugal, I browse through the wildfire information in module three with great interest, especially the practice of prescribed burning to mimic, mimic the natural fire cycle in the forest and reduce dangerous overload of woody fuel. I have read of big fires in the region around Ashland, even after implementing the strategy. So I wonder what are the success rates with prescribed burning? And do you think it could be applicable to Southern Europe? Or do you know if it's being successfully applied? Yes, yes, yes. Lots of great things to talk about here. So um, first and foremost, if you if you're totally unfamiliar with wildfire, I I made a video, I uh, made a documentary uh, about wildfire, our situations with it, and a couple of great tools and practices to go with it, uh, called Facing Wildfire: Building Resiliency to Wildfire on YouTube. Um, I think there might be a link to this actually at the top of the document. I feel like I've done this before. Uh, I have done it before, but it's not here. Okay. So uh, I will grab that eventually if somebody else doesn't. We've got a lot of tech-friendly people here. Um, and that's a good video to get a sense of how we get ourselves into our fire issues in terms of uh, exclusion, suppression. So exclusion is um, we're never going to allow a fire to start. Suppression is when a fire starts, we're going to snuff it out. Um, the militarization of fire suppression post-World War II which was a big issue, uh, the lack and loss of cultural burning of indigenous uh, indigenous peoples on on different continents and different pieces of land, and how they did that because it was it was specific at point to point. As I was doing the documentary, I had an opportunity to train with the Yurok tribe in northwestern California, and uh, spent ten days on a cultural burn. So they do prescribe burn trainings within the. Um, wildfire service, both in Canada and America, and in, actually internationally, we had a lot of people at this prescribed burn training from like Spain and Portugal, Australia, people come from all over the world to learn different types of approaches. Mm -hmm. Theirs was specific to the First Nation tribe of the Yurok. And we learned the process of how to work with these fires um, and how to light fires, uh, which was very, very interesting to me because uh, for my entire life, I was a Boy Scout and, you know, always camping, growing up in Canada, you do a lot of that. And I've always put fires out. I've never actively gone and lit the bush or lit, lit the fire or lit the forest on fire. So it was a very different approach to it. I think... Prescription burning has a couple of applications. Uh, you will find different perspectives on this. I know um, I hosted a, a great webinar with Joan Webster and David Holmgren last year, and David actually doesn't share this opinion with me. Um, he feels that um, any burning produces too much carbon and that has um, uh, more negative effects than uh, beneficial effects is basically his approach. Um, I tend to disagree. I tend to think that climate change has a variable, uh, as a variable conversation with a variable, uh, number of metrics, carbon being one of them, uh, the amount of water that's been aerosolized into the atmosphere is the other. So I think that there's an application for this. I just want to make it clear that I'm, I'm, this is not the only opinion. Um, so prescription wildfire is a way to do what's called low and slow burning. Uh, it's usually tended in a very uh, calm way. It usually is never lit in such a way that it gets out of hand. 
unless there are two fires burning together, in which case they're both burning from the black uh, into the green, and then they're they're extinguishing the green material, and then everything that has been burnt is done. Um, I think it's completely applicable in Southern Europe. I would probably, if it were I, I would see if there is application for use of grazing animals first, things like goats. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, Jeanette Hall, runs an amazing um, uh, shepherd, uh, shepherdess, amazing shepherdess who runs an outfit out of Alberta, Canada called Bad Plant Management. It's hilarious. And uh, it's a very viable business. So it's something that she does because she loves working with goats and and being uh, and working with livestock husbandry um, and does it pretty continually. What are the success rates with the prescription burning? So uh, there was a portion of the documentary I wasn't able to put in or the portion of my research I wasn't able to put into the documentary because the government official I spoke with uh, said it wasn't official and it would have negative impacts on the forestry industry in Canada, but it was fascinating. So there's this area in Southwestern British Columbia and there was a, a fire that went through years before. And there was a demarcation on this area where it was a it was a forestry block. So they'd gone back in after cut, they had planted specifically, they tried a different uh, number of different types of, of planting um, layouts. And this fire had come through unbeknownst to them, but had only affected a portion of it. There was another fire that came through five to 10 years later and the fire ravaged, just ravaged the areas that hadn't burned, which for this gentleman who I was speaking with was a very positive indicator of the success rates of prescription burning. Um, it doesn't mean areas that have burnt can't burn before, but it's also important to understand. And Louisa, I think we were talking, I was talking to you about this in your feedback is that there's a ground fire and then there's a crown fire. And when you have uh, a ground fire, it's basically eating up fuels that are on the ground. So anything that's loose and, and available, it's going to eat that up. And the problem with that is if it gets to what's called ladder fuels, L-A-D-D-E-R, it'll climb the trees and get into the crown. And once something becomes a crown fire, it becomes exceptionally hot. And then it has an ember front, which means there's these, uh, it creates a bit of its own weather and it starts shooting embers ahead of it. In Australia, this has been measured up to a kilometer to two kilometers. So a kilometer in advance, you have these embers that are being uh, thrown in advance. And it's one of the things that if you're interested in, defending against a house, this is the number one thing you have to be worried about because it's not necessarily the flames that are licking a house or a building that will destroy it. It's these embers that will get into dry spots in a house and take it down. Um, Joan Webster's book, Bushfire Safety, uh, is amazing. Just 100%. And her story as a, as a person is pretty incredible as well. So totally could be applicable to Southern Europe. Um, would probably be pretty novel, would probably take somebody being a pioneer in such a thing. I started doing prescription burns on my land basically the year after I learned the process and found a huge amount of success in keeping the vegetation low so that we, we weren't creating um, we weren't creating a fire load uh, into the drier portions of the season. Um, and yeah, I think that's probably a good place to stop because if I continue, it'll be an entire hour. But if we have extra time, I'll come back and I'll talk a little bit more about it. But generally what we want to do within these three areas, the ground, the ladder, and the crown, just general rules, any facility area, any infrastructure that we don't want to burn, we usually want to keep a 15 meter fire break, which I know sounds massive, but those breaks can also include things like gardens. Why? Because tomatoes are 99% water and don't burn that well. So we can use different types of elements within a landscape to create a break. Um, if we do have a lot of ground fuels, we want to keep them low. So keep the vegetation density low, either by choosing what we're planning, planting, being conscientious about vegetative, um, vegetative grazing, being conscientious. And this is where Joan and David and I had an interesting conversation. It's still up on YouTube. If you want to check it out, if anybody wants to find it and throw it in the chat, that'd be great. Um, we had a fascinating conversation about how no mulch around um, a house in Australia is recommended because it's so flammable. 
um, which is a really fascinating conversation. And then ladder fuels. So keeping the trees uh, within the native portions of your forest, obviously not the production, because we want to keep those low for, for ability for picking, but any of those other trees you want to limb up to basically the height that you can reach with a pole pruner. So generally around our land, I created a 15 meter break around our house. And then I limbed up any tree to the height of my pole pruner, which me plus the pro pole pruner was about 15, 15 feet, you know, three to four meters. Um, sometimes I got to 20 feet. Um, and then the other piece is just being conscientious about um, the elements within your house that could have infiltration for embers. Kong Wang has raised his hand. Go ahead, Kong. Hi. Uh, yeah. So I think I realized I'm probably in the other weekly sessions, but something you said got me interested there, uh, Javin. It's like when you say uh, control burning releases too much carbon, right? The other perspective. And then you say, so it's like I read a while ago something that interested me saying like plastic, if it's not wasted, it's actually one of the like good mediums to store carbon for a very long time before releasing it. So I I was under the the you know the perception that slow burns yields more charcoal, which is more long term carbon storage, and it doesn't release as much. Whereas I see what you're fires. saying. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, a, so I'm not going to a, a a low oxygen conversation. I'm going to a slow burn. So okay. when when we create something called uh, biochar, we use uh, uh we basically retard the amount of oxygen that could come into the burn process. So that way. Like you're saying, we lose most of the, the material itself. And in its place, we have a huge amount of surface area because the gas is what burns. So if we allow the gas to off gas out of uh, a carbon material, we get what's called recalcitrant carbon. And that recalcitrant carbon creates a huge amount of surface area, mm -hmm. which works out really well. In terms of a slow intensity burn, uh, we don't get that same result because it is still using up a huge amount of oxygen because we're not necessarily changing the vessel in which it's being burnt. We're just burning slowly and being conscientious. So I learned, um, initially I learned uh, prescription burning by a man who has had a history of burning in Southeastern British Columbia for roughly uh, four to 5,000 years from his oral history and tradition. And um mm -hmm he really <laughs> he had a problem with all the the firefighters coming in with all their gear and their drip torches when he was like we burn with a pack of matches and a rake so he would you know slowly rake the fire towards where he wanted it and would do it at such a time where that made sense um but i i hear completely what you're saying um in terms of that recalcitrant long-term carbon that that really isn't what we end up with in prescription burning okay but it's a good, good, good point. And yeah, good to see you, Francis. You're totally welcome here. We can, we can have you here. No problem. Um, Lucas, go ahead, sir. Oh, I was just going to comment on the, uh, you had said about taking down like the lower branches and the trees. And it's something I plan on um, this fall. Cause we can't, I can't burn anything here. There's so many regulations and so many, but that seemed like a good, and I, when I was doing uh, the first assignment, I had read that, uh, you know, the folks that were here, you know, a thousand years ago or whatever, you know, hundreds of years ago, that's what they did that as well to make um, the forest more navigable. And then also so that you could see off at a further distance, which I, I, I kind of like the idea of being able to, cause right now it's kind of a, it's, uh, it's all blocked off by a lot of that lower stuff and other things. So I just wanted to, I guess it has other benefits as well. And it's something I'm going to try to do this fall, I think. Oh, that's a great point, Lucas. And it brings up a story that uh, I found while researching. So up in Northern Alberta in a place called Fort Mac, which uh, Fort McLeod, which a lot of people know because of the oil sands that are being extracted there. Um, at the turn of the century, sort of 1905, 1908, there was a group, uh, there was a group that were, were going through some of these trails and they were, um, they were managing the trails and it was a, uh, I think it was a, a Cree group up there that they had hired to do this. And the foreman was late. He was like a couple hours late. And he basically was going up the trail to catch up with his crew. And he kept on coming, uh, coming upon these little fires and he, he kept on putting them out and patting himself on the back. And when he finally got there to lunch, there was another fire. There was a like lunch fire that the crew had set up the Cree workers had set up and then there was a fire kind of ahead of them and they they were doing this just at the end of 
winter. So the pathways, because of the albedo effect of having Earth being open, um, was being able to was able to melt the snow quicker. So the path and generally the sides around it was without snow, but the bush was still very laden with snow or was very wet. So it was a perfect time to clear the trail with fire instead of taking up all the effort of cutting and everything else. And he comes up and he just like, he just lashes them back and forth. Like, how dare you all the, all the rest of this. And he's like, and the Cree turned around and was like, how do you think that these were managed for thousands of years? And, and this gentleman had relayed the story and put it into the annals. But uh, what was so fascinating about that is one of the major reasons that the Cree did it on the foothills is exactly your, your point is that it would burn out the underbrush and it would be more navigable. You could see, um, you could see approaching animals. You can see approaching people. It has a lot of value. The second part of this, which was which was really fascinating to me, because I uh, I worked for Alberta Parks for a while and almost worked for the national park system, is the park system has taken a snapshot of the ecology and wants it to be that way forever. And it's not natural, one hundred percent. It's kind of like when you go and visit family members and they remembers you as being 12 or 15, right? They've got a snapshot of you and they won't let you grow up in their mind. Same thing with fire and ecology. We haven't allowed the majority of our forests to burn at all. And so they're very dense. And so when we look at these landscapes, when we look at these dense landscapes, for me, now that I've 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 brought some awareness to myself and and I've re-educated mostly my my visual ability, my visual sense, there's this conversation about how, what's the penetration of sightline? How how deeply can you look into an area? And the majority of the forest that I visit or recreate in, you can barely look 10 feet. And that's high to very high fire risk. So your point about navigability and being able to see through it is really well taken and I really appreciate the comment. Thank you very much. It's a great piece. Okay, um, Ash, okay. So these these are great questions. I really liked your set of questions here, Atha, because it really, it brings about the conversation of context. So each person's context is gonna be different. Um, you could be in a monsoonal uh, area, but you may not have clay soils. You could have clay soils, but maybe you're not in a monsoon. There's all of these different variables. So again, I want to pull us back to first principles, pull us back to patterns, to details, and talk about generally this these series of questions is how do I work with clay soils? How and when might I decompact these soils? How when should I put in ground cover? Um, and how, how do I work with my context? So... Um, She's in India, uh, and there's a monsoon season. So there's an area of intense periods of rain and then almost nothing on the sides. And if we click on her site project, which thanks so much for putting here, and this is why the portfolio is built the way it is, so we can go back and check elements that build upon each other as we go throughout. Um, her climate survey really gave us a good sense. So this is the one I liked here. So basically we're seeing what that precipital value is and then we're tapering off towards the end. So there's kind of a number of different things I want to talk about. And then we maybe we can all kind of have a thought about what we might do about this. So is the monsoon season the most suitable time for sowing ground cover seed? So Generally, when we're talking about sowing ground cover seeds, we generally want to do it at a time when it'll have a, a, the best chance of purchase. So it won't wash away. It won't be lost. It won't be eaten by birds. So there's all these little pieces here we want to be conscientious about. So there's lots of ways to do ground cover seeding uh, at an industrial scale with things like seed drills um, or at you know a personal scale just by hand broadcasting. And there's a specific way to hold your hand and grab your type of seed and make sure it comes in a good arc and all those good things. But generally we want to do it at a time where we know that there's not going to be um, predation upon those seeds by birds or other insects. We also want to make sure that there's going to be enough water to germinate. Uh, we also want to make sure that they'll have purchase. So usually if you put seeds just onto uh, bare land that's been compacted, those seeds won't grow. Usually they won't have purchase. They won't have the ability to be in the dark. So we may want to do some tilting of that land. Tilting is different than uh, plowing. Tilting is just the inversion of the first couple of inches of soil. Whereas an inversion plow or plowing is actually mixing the whole soil at depth, sometimes up to three or four feet, a uh, meter and a bit. 
So I'd be conscientious about doing it at a time when there was enough moisture. I'd be conscious about doing a time when there's enough moisture, but not so much moisture that we wash away the seed. I'd be conscientious, conscientious about doing it at a time when I could do a little bit of decompaction. And that might be tilting just so I can get that purchase in. Or if there is some systemic decompact or compaction issues, I would probably want to decompact first, probably do a bit of smoothing and then do some tilting or some incorporation of a ground cover. And, and you may have to tilt you know, two or three years in a row to get the ground cover you want or add to it. And so the question then becomes when to do that, because generally these clay soils that um, Ash is dealing with are, uh, are quite thick and, and heavy. So one of the questions was, um, when would you might de decompact this last question? You mentioned the importance of mechanical decompaction immediately introducing ground cover. However, considering that my set is heavy clay soil is prone to water logging, it may not be able to do, I, I may not be able to follow this process during the monsoon. Would it be more practical to tackle soil compaction after the monsoon during the winter months when there is less rain may not be ideal for ground cover. I'm more concerned about water availability for the ground cover seed. Should I consider, consider postponing the plan and carry it out pre-monsoon next season? So here's the issue with clay soils. Clay soils is are usually quite heavy and working them takes a lot of, of energy, either be it by people or by mechanization. So there, there's an argument to be said that post monsoon, chances are that soil is more workable and it'll actually have quite a bit of water in it. It won't be as, it won't be as bioavailable as if it were uh, having higher concentrations of silt, silt or sand, organic matter. So I would say, it's probably a good idea to do a test plot, to do a test plot of pre and a test plot of post, unless you come up with an idea that you think is bomb proof and you go for it. Generally, I tend to do what's called nucleated design. So I try something in a small area, try it for a season. If it works really well, replicate it. If it doesn't, open the book of nature again, read the lines that you misread and try it one more time. The reason why I do it that way, it's the same thing with irrigation. Generally, I'll leave irrigation on the surface uh, for a year just to make sure I'm I'm happy with generally where it's routed and everything else. If you've got the ability to, it's not always the case. Um, and then dig it in the next year. So I would say try it at the preseason, see what the work and the energy and the effort is to try and get it into and put it in and see what the take rate is and then do it postseason and try again, see what it looks like then. And from there, you're going to have a good baseline between both. The other question you had was, um, what are the options for handling to remove weeds? Should they be incorporated into the soil or used as mulch? So the problem with taking weeds and immediately incorporating them back into the soil is you're basically planting them again. And there's a number of plants that will propagate by rhizome or root. And if you just chop them up and put them back into the soil, you'll have more of them than you had before. Um, Comfrey is a great example of this. We use comfrey a lot in gardening, specifically the Bocking, B-O-K-I-N-G, Bocking 14 comfrey that is uh, seed sterile. So it means it's not going to propagate by seed because once comfrey is in a garden, if you chop up the root, you only have to do this once to realize you never want to do it again. It can regrow from a quarter inch of root into a whole new plant. So we don't want to have that conversation happen again if we take this weed out and we incorporate it back into the soil. Um, that said, if we were to remove the weeds, put them into a pile, let them desiccate and dry, and we then brought them back in when we were either plowing or incorporating or decompacting, that could be totally viable as well. Generally, what I'll do is if the plant can't reassert itself, um, even under like comfrey, if you pull it out and you put it into a layer of, of plants um, as mulch, it can still reassert itself. So generally, if you know that the plants you pull are not going to reassert themselves, then I will pull and leave as 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 um, as mulch, just right off the bat. And it's amazing how quickly a thick pile of mulch with a little bit of a uh, little bit of microorgan microorganism activity can start to decompact even clay soils, just because you finally have mulch upon it. So that would be my conversation. So for you, you'd have to then figure out what plants do I have, how do they reassert, how do they propagate, how do I work with them. Just noticing something here on the chat. Uh, I thought we used comfrey as a green manure for chop and drop. Yep, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, nothing's ever going to be, we use it so we don't have to be conscientious about it. Comfrey is used as um, 
a biomass producer. Um, it is used as, sometimes it's used as a compost catalyst. Sometimes we can cut it, cut and drop, cut, chop and drop, chop and drop, and it creates a lot of mulch. Absolutely. Uh, but it can also become a nuisance if it's tilled because if it's tilled or chopped, if it, the roots chopped up, uh, it can be, you can have a patch of, of comfrey. And usually we only have a few comfrey plants within the garden for, for biomass accumulation. We don't necessarily want a bed of comfrey. Uh, it's not usually what we're, what we're after. Ash, does that answer your question? Did you have any follow-up questions to that? Okay, it sounds like probably not. Okay, cool. Any other questions as we are sitting here and chatting? Because I think what I'll do is if there isn't any questions um, or anybody who wants to weigh in on an aspect of the course, I'll probably go into the next set of uh, assignments after this week's uh, sector analysis conversation. I have, I have a question. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if this is a bit off topic, but I just had, um, I'm curious a little bit more about <clears throat> habitat ponds. I, I saw the video on them. Um, this might seem a bit basic, but again, I just wanted to get your general input. Um, how do you make it so that they don't become like a nursery for mosquitoes or how do people <laughs> mitigate that? Totally. Great question. Um, so generally when we're talking about habitat ponds and Bill Molson had a, a piece about this, that any project should be a third water. Um, uh, it, it should have a fair amount of, of either wetlands. It should have either water retention areas or things like habitat ponds or crater gardens or things of that nature. So once you have that water there, and this is the question everybody has, and I love that you brought it up is how do you keep mosquitoes at bay? So generally mosquitoes mean that we have an imbalance within the predatory nature of that ecosystem. Um, and the, the best element of, of, controlling mosquitoes is making sure that you have a lot of dragonfly larvae and and other types of amphibians and reptiles that will eat uh, mosquito larvae as food. So generally, if you just put a pond in and that's it and walk away, the mosquitoes will find it. And you, they'll be very happy about, about this new hotel that you've given them. However, if instead you say, okay, well, I'm going to be conscientious about mimicking a small pond or small wetland. I'm going to have planting zones. I'm going to have different depths. This is one of the things that everybody does wrong. I went to Kenya to work on a project. They'd been making ponds there for 10 years and all of them suffered from the same problem was they were all the same depth. And so the same depth pond was like an evaporation pan. It all got hot at the same time. It all evaporated at the same time and all the tilapia died at the same time. So whenever we're creating any kind of pond structure, we want to have different tiers and different depths because what will end up happening is that that deep portion will become like a cooling column of water that will help a little a little bit of uh, circulation happen and also as these sides start to heat up this will help cool it so you'll moderate the amount of evaporation that'll be happening in that so that's first and foremost second is make sure you have some planting areas within the pond so putting in a little bit of soil in there is great what kind of soil would you put in there go to a local pond and transplant some soil in mass so you don't want to take some soil and sprinkle it as if you're sprinkling salt you want to take it like uh, an ecological plug, if you will, the same way they, they do with coral reefs. We want to take that ecology, transplant it and bring it into your pond. Why would we do that? It's going to be full of eggs of, of nematodes and um, uh, um, water bugs and water beetles and dragonflies and even mosquitoes, but you're going to transplant that ecology and that predatory element there. The last portion you could do is if you want, you can introduce fish into these ponds um, and help to create a bit more of that connective cycle. Um, the, the piece about planting is important. So generally when I'm replanting or creating uh, a, a pond or some kind of, of habitat pond, I'm going to take things like rushes, reeds, cattails from our local ponds and going to transplant them there as well. This again creates more of the floral aspect of of the pond to complement that fauna aspect. So generally that's what I do. I have a number of um, a number of different elements in that pond. I had a colleague of mine in Africa who was raising tilapia in an in almost basically a habitat pond. 
And they did something very, pretty, pretty genius. They had all these fly zappers above, which would also attract mosquitoes. And they just took the bottoms out. So basically the flies would come get zapped and dropped and would feed the tilapia. It was this interesting little uh, additional feeding setup, which was a neat way to do it. So that's what I would do is just make sure that the ecology is set up well. And then, you know, monitor if it looks like we're getting too much more of that mosquito population, I probably transplant more soil. Um, and the other thing is, is I transplant water. So I'll take, you know, a couple of five gallon buckets from the pond and use that to jump start that water ecology as well. When you're working with aquaculture, actually, when you're working with aquaculture or soil culture, you really want to do these kind of large scale inoculations. Does that, does that help answer the question? Very, very much. I'm taking note of everything. Um, tell me when to stop because I have another question. Sure. Go ahead. Um, Okay, so if uh, the area I would be able to make one would be quite small. Um, I'm wondering about, they said in the video that if you want to control seepage, you have to compact the soil or you have to line it. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking giving it's a small area and I don't have particularly like great tools maybe to compact the soil enough. I might try to look into lining it. And I'm wondering what you suggest about like what, what to line it with and how and what you might do in that situation if it's a small area like maybe thinking about like maybe even just like a couple meters you know mm -hmm. like across and that sort of thing yeah so if if generally we're working in a small area i tend to look for prefab out of the box options so i take a look at um uh, pre-made liners pre-made pre like habitat liners that actually have depth and and all the rest of it um, the only reason being is that it's it's really easy to use. So you you purchase it, you dig the hole, you put it in, you're done. All the rest of these options are going to be a lot more effort. So just know that as we move along the spectrum, you're going to be like, well, that's a lot of work. Yes, and we're going to prime you for that. Um, are there are there non plastic prefab options that you're aware of? You know, none that I know of. There is something called uh, impregnated uh, bentonite or impregnated bentonite geowoven textile, which is used specifically for the tailing ponds in the oil sands. Um, they tend to be more rectilinear and you tend to be more, uh, yeah, more rectilinear and, and really at scale. So there's nothing I know of that is pre-purchased that isn't plastic based. Um, the, the other options for liners are still kind of in the plastic petroleum conversation. One's called an EPDM, EPDM liner. If you use an EPDM liner, you want it to be non-fire retardant. The reason for this is fire retardant is a biocide. And so if you use that for pond lining or for lining a roof, which is also problematic because um, the soil you put on top of it, of course, has living things in it, can be can basically destroy your soil. Um, so an EPDM pond liner, that said, I've worked in Kenya and Cuba where if they find something that will hold water, they will use it. So I've seen um, little uh, ponds made out of tires where they're using a top tire and a smaller tire to make a large and a smaller um, element within that. Um, one of the things we did quite a bit in Kenya is we did um, what's called ferro cement or concrete uh, pond. So basically what we do is we would dig our area, we would put in uh, chicken, chicken wire or a small gauge mesh, and then we would put in a like concrete. for rebar, right? Yeah, just like yeah. the yeah, yeah, this is a little bit more flexible. It's kind of like the chicken wire that's quite quite a bit flexible. Whereas with rebar, you're, you're usually doing like a, a three, four, five, six gauge um, uh, metal. Uh, and so that can work out really well. If it's a small area, it's one of the things that I've done over and over again, and I really like it. You can usually put in a, a waterproofing material in Canada and, and uh, America. I do something called Zypex, um, X, Y, P, E, C, or P, E, X, Zypex. Um, and you mix that in with the final layer and it basically glasses the surface of the concrete. The reason why we did it in, in Kenya is that... Uh, the EPDM liners, A, were expensive, B, hard to put in, and C, they would oversilt. These ponds would get a lot of siltation in them. And uh, when they went in to dig them out, they would puncture the liner. So concrete, I, I find, is the cheapest, most readily available. It's kind of fun to do if you like plastering. I do. I used to work uh, 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 natural building, and so I do a lot of plastering, and so it's, it's quite a bit of fun. I also worked as a contract 
contract assistant for my dad for years. So we did a lot of like mudding for drywall and whatnot. So, um, so that's doable. Then we move into our clay options. So basically if you have, and I would imagine Ash probably has, um, something similar. Um, if you get up to the 30 and 40% of clay, you can just use the soil itself. And, and you can use that to basically create your, your line by smoothing it out a bit. The way that Sepp Holzer does it and his prodigy, um, Zach Weiss, who runs Water Stories, is basically you get a little bit of water and you get an articulating um, bucket with a rotating knuckle on your excavator. And you basically compact the soil with a little bit of water. And so basically all of the particulates come together and they create not an impermeable surface, because all naturally lined ponds and even unnaturally pond, unnaturally lined ponds eventually will leak. It's just a matter of time. So over time, what will happen is that will then seep in and seep in. And over time, you'll get uh, what's called a glay soil, G-L-E-Y, a glay soil. And these are the soils that we'll see across all wetlands and ponds. Those are those are the soils that when you stick your, your boot in as you're walking along the shoreline, as you lift your foot up, the boot stays put. That's that self-healing glay soil that we're working towards over time. And there's a lot of ways to develop that. Uh, folks have done it with pigs and with ducks um, inside the area. They just feed them and fence them into this pond. Um, it's not very effective in terms of its consistency. Every once in a while, you hear somebody has done it and they've done it well and it's worked, but generally it takes a long time and a lot of effort. If you don't have clay, you can bring clay in. Usually you want to go a foot to a foot and a half of clay, which is a lot. The other option, which a lot of people look to, um, and pretty much, you know, nine times out of 10 fails because it just doesn't work as bentonite. So bentonite is a clay that'll swell 10 times its size. It comes in, uh, it comes in a, a granulated uh, format. It comes in those impregnated geotextile woven sheets, and it also comes in a powder format. And the idea is, and one of the things that uh, bentonite sellers and 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 uh, distributors will say is like, you just throw a bag or two in your pond, and because of the way that water seeps, it'll find those seepages. After a decade of hearing this and trying it, I have yet to see a pond that's been fixed by bentonite by just the 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 powdered form i have incorporated bentonite into an area and and um uh rototilled it in and it and it worked but it took three and a half years for it to develop and finally hold water the last thing we tried which i don't recommend and i'm saying to make sure people don't do it is we took granulated bentonite soaked it and then with by hand impregnated it into jute sacks because I was a bit of a purist when I started this 15 years ago. I was like, it's not going to be plastic. It's not going to be concrete. I'm going to make a better, I'm going to make a better mousetrap. I did not make a better mousetrap. It took a lot of time and effort and, and, and took about four years for it to eventually work because over time, again, those glaze soils will develop. And there's so much organic matter within a pond or a body of water that when it settles out, it does start to create that sort of Glay, G L E Y, glay like soils and starts to seal things. So, you know, that's that's kind of the spectrum I've seen here, Francis, with fiberglass, concrete, landscape fabric do the trick. Uh, potentially, I've, I've, I've used fiberglass um, uh, vessels and just plop them into the ground. I, I've never used a fabric that I can put in. Um, I have I have done concrete. Um, yeah, it's uh, I usually done with that like chicken wire or small mesh wire that you can mold over and then pin. Usually what you do is you take that mesh in and you pin it into the ground with a long irrigation um, staples, like six to 12 inches. Uh, and then you, you skim over. Usually you put a base down first. So you put a kind of a crush base down. So that way, as the concrete that's holding the water starts to get heavy, it has something to push against. And then that can push against the ground. If you just use the ferro cement, as the skim, it'll usually crack. It just doesn't have that uh, tensile strength to actually hold the water. Um, let's see if I remember anything else that I've done in the past. You know, how deep might you go? Sorry, go ahead. Oh, how deep might you go for a smaller habitat oh, pond? Yeah, um, I like doing deep areas, so I'd probably, I'd probably go, you know, three to four feet if I could in the deepest <laughs> zone. And then do like a foot and a half to two feet for my shallows or even half a foot. If it's of like, we did this, this was a pond that we created on Salt Spring Island 
west coast of British Columbia, Canada. And it was the pond for the ducks. So basically the ducks would come swim in it, they would poop. And we wanted a way to fertigate, which is when you take um, usually feces or urine in solution from animals and you, you run it through your garden. So we had a pipe right at the bottom that had a valve at the other end. And we wanted to keep it at a certain level. So there was a float valve to make sure that it was always at the level that the ducks needed it. Um, and then we had the ability to bring it out. And so one of the reasons why we had such a deep zone is because at some point we wanted to completely drain out the pond, use it for fertigation and muck out the pond as well. So it really depends on you. If you have small kids, um, you may decide not to go that deep or fence it off. Um, or if you're worried about any of that, you may decide to go pretty shallow, in which case it would be like a foot and two feet. I think everybody knows a child can drown in like three to six inches of water. So, you know, water on site equals potential hazards. So be careful. But uh, I like doing deeper, deeper areas because it means you're going to get different strata of ecology that will enjoy that, um, enjoy that depth. Thank you. Hey, you're so welcome. Okay, uh, Comfrey 689, you, you could tell us a bit about your own garden and site, Javin, if you like. How is it set up? Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about the Canadian site, because that was uh, what I was in previously. I'm now I'm now in Ecuador, and uh, this site is, is very different because I landed in a rental. Um, so here we've got like three dozen pre-existing three dozen fruit trees, have a small garden, Growing in the tropics is always a bit of a uh, a wonder for those of us in temperate climates because you plant on Tuesday and by Tuesday the next week you're usually seeing a little radical come up. Where just in the the, the temperate um, temperate climates, you're waiting a couple of weeks to things to see things come up. But basically, my site and how do I want to do this? You know what? I think what I'm going to do is bring um, bring my iPad into it and have it jump into the uh, the conversation here. So it'll just take me a moment. That way I can draw out a couple of things. There's actually a really, um, really awesome element of this design that continues to perform really well. I was just back there recently and uh, did, uh, yeah. I will talk about it instead of mutter under my breath, making me seem like a crazy person. Um, okay, so I need to join this meeting. I need to send it over to me. It's going to want to take control. So send it to self. Good questions today, everybody. That's great. And uh, the other thing I wanted to say was uh, thanks everybody for the great assignments. I was really impressed with everything that I saw. Uh, no audio. Uh, stay co-host. Got it. And we're going to remove the video because nobody needs to see that. Stop video. And then I'm going to bring up Morfolio. Um, if we haven't talked about Morfolio Trace, it's probably a good time to chat about it. Um, Morfolio Trace is a program and application that I've used for a couple of years now and really enjoyed using it. It's, uh, it's unfortunately only for iOS. So if you're not, um, if you're not on iPad, then that's not going to work for you, but, um, yeah, really, really appreciate how this all works. Okay. So let's share screen, start broadcast, go back to zoom, see if it takes over. There we go. Cool. Great. So we want to come back to this. Okay, cool. So this was my site in Canada. There we go. This is my site in Canada and a couple of things to share. Um, so I'm just going to click on this first. Have a new sheet that comes over top. There we go. Going to make sure the opacity is down to zero so we can see it. Nice. Okay. So yeah, this was the house site. Um, right across from the house, we had a barn. And uh, there's a couple elements that got put in. So this is right after we took out the trees for the break. So you can see here, we took um, quite a bit out, out here. We took out here, we removed trees back. Um, 
there was a huge cluster of trees here that were all rotted out. So we took all those out. There's a small copse here that we kept just because it was pretty beautiful. So that was our, our fire prepped and um, conversation about that. Uh, and then what I wanted to do was I wanted to develop a garden that was right close to the house that we could come to time and time again and work with. And it was easy to set up cheap all the rest of it um over here in this corner um my husband had for years had uh had horses and had fed horses here for you know upwards of 12 years and so there was a, a massive treasure trove of soil just waiting so i paid about 550 bucks for a guy to come with his excavator a dump truck and basically he would just grab this material come over here and would make this monstrous pile uh and then with uh, a little skid steer, little uh, bobcat, we just spread it over the entire area. If I were to do it again, I'd probably be a little bit more specific about spreading it because I didn't necessarily need it on the pathways, but it was worked you know, relatively well. So basically after I had this all spread, so this was all spread with, um, uh, all spread with uh, manure. I'm one of those that really likes concrete food production i'm not i'm not as interested in some of the more whimsical permaculture where there's like a little garden here and a little garden there i'm going for food production so the last season we grew there i grew 450 pounds of tomatoes open air uh didn't ripen outside but got them really close brought in all the tomatoes uh let them ripen inside and then dehydrated them because for me i like shelf stable uh, food security so that way I don't have to worry about freezers and things of that nature and I I'm not a huge fan of canning I can can uh, but I also like the concentration of flavors that usually comes out of dehydrating so as much as possible I try to dehydrate and then basically what I did is I had all of these little rows of uh, they were about 28 feet if I remember correctly um, and they were basically a 30 inch bed and 30 inch beds have been standardized pretty much across market gardening. Um, the 30 inch bed allows you to reach over and allows you to straddle with your legs. If you're of a certain, you know, general average size, if you're shorter, you want to make it shorter, but I like being able to straddle a bed and work it. Um, and, uh, the other thing is, is I have a severe straw allergy massive to the point to where I can't be around it. And I get, um, really problematic. So I, I've been practicing and, and playing with wood chip kind of back to Eden gardening for a couple of years, but because I was also the only person that was going to be working on this and it was, I was producing enough food for a family of four. Um, I ended up going with a geo woven textile called uh sun, what sun, uh, DeWalt, DeWitt, DeWitt Sunbelt, I think is what it's called. You see it a lot in market gardening because it leaves holes for the plants, but then it also allows for water to come through. Um, and it, it was purely a labor saving conversation because I wanted to make sure I had as much, uh, possible in this area. Um, if I had more wood chips or I had access to wood chips, I would be doing that, but because I didn't have any of that and I was trying to create a garden in short form, I had decompose, decompose, decomposted, composted, decomposed. That's what I was going for. Decomposed horse manure, which had been composted, which is my favorite to make an instant garden. And then I had the ability to plant almost directly into it. So there was all these ones around the sides and then these were around the beds. And so these, these outside ones were my perennials. These were my perennial beds, uh, both of these sides. And then I had um, two big perennial beds down here. So both of these as well were perennials, perennial. And then I had all my vegetables and my onions and my beets and my kales and you know everything else inside here. Uh, year two, we did two big expansions. I'm just going to erase this. Um, and totally fine to answer this question now, but this is one of those things where if you had answer, if you'd asked me earlier, I would be able to bring some more recent photos and kind of show you some, um, some different elements here. We ended up putting a secondary garden here and this became uh, the, the tomato hothouse, um, only because this was kind of a hot area because we had all of this bounce radiation that came off the house and created a nice hot area. So this is where I did the 450 pounds of tomatoes. Um, I think I have this next one as a full design. Just have to find it. Give me one sec. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. 
So it's one of these. Yeah. So this one. So this is off the shop. Uh, this is, let's just take a look here. This was the fencing area. That was the calculations. Yeah, so this this is a good one to work off of. Uh, aha, yeah, perfect. Found the right one. Cool. So I'm going to just put another layer on and then throw opacity down so I can explain this. Cool. So you're going to do this when you get into assignment or week five. Um, you're going to run calculations in terms of how much water. Uh-oh. We're charged and we're losing. Um, how much water uh, is coming into and off of a site. And when I take a look at roofs, I take a look at potential water that can be stored. So what I did is I calculated this area. So this area here should be using blue. I calculated this area here. And as you see, it was something to the tune of uh, 34,000 liters of water a year. So um, divide that by four to get gallons. Now, this water was basically coming to a drip edge and, and just dropping off into this area. So what I decided to do was to dig a trench. And this trench was, I think I scaled this. Yeah. So this trench was about a meter and a bit. Uh, and it was a hookah culture trench. So this was about a meter and a half wide by about a meter and a half deep and had all these tines that came off of it. This bottom tine didn't end up happening. It's actually just a big E. And uh, we had this big hookah culture trench and then we mounded up on top of this. So we had these beds. Now you notice that I didn't mound over top of this, this E here. I just left that at grade and then mounted up on these other areas on these, these three here. Now what happened with this as a design is in year one, it charged up. So all of the snow that fell on it and all the rain that fell on the shop. And basically they're about the same size. So I was estimating that was about 60,000, uh, 60,000 liters of water or four, one, two, five. So 15, um, 15,000 gallons or 60,000 liters. Um, and in that year, we planted all of our squash into beds, uh, just uh, beds one and beds two. That was it. I actually left bed three covered with a tarp because I didn't want any weeds to come out into it. And this was crazy because up here, this was the first year of the heat dome. This was installed in 2020. So this would be 2021 or 2022. And the heat dome for us got up to 54 degrees Celsius, according to our thermometers. And I didn't water this once, not once throughout the entire season. There was no water that went into this bed. The squash are brilliant. The plants were brilliant. We did have an issue with pocket gophers that found it and thought, oh my God, somebody made us a beautiful place to live forever. Um, but that was uh, that was the major issue about that. And then we started doing some trapping um, that helped. But uh, this was a great way of building in-ground water sequestration, increased water holding capacity, using the water that was coming off the shop that didn't have a gutter, putting it directly into um, this material and then putting it in. Now, some of you who have gotten feedback from me before might be saying, Javin, you've told us never to infiltrate water three meters close to a building. And you would be absolutely right. This is um, very much closer than three meters. My rationale was this water is not only dropping, you know, it's, it's dropping within like 10 centimeters. It was a very short overhang, 10 centimeters of the building. Any damage that's been done to that building is done. Like it's, it's done. I, I can't do anything about it. So I didn't feel terribly about creating something that would actually hold that water away from because eventually it'll wick towards um, this area and uh, building up capacity. So this was my my second big um, or my third. This was my third big change on that landscape that we were working with East Shop Plot. Yeah. And uh, turned out really, really well. It was uh, it took uh, machine time. It took about uh, I think it was close to $500 again. Um, we didn't end up fencing it. Uh, we did get up, we did get posted, in, but we never got a chance to get it fenced. But remarkably enough, the deer didn't bother it mostly because of our dog. Uh, this is one of the reasons why we work with, um, with, uh, with, land, with, uh, shepherding dogs so well. So that's the, uh, 
that's the conversation about that one. Thanks for asking about uh, my site. That's awesome. Uh, any follow-up questions to any of that for anybody? Check out the chat. I've recently had um, success using Jasper AI to do some market research and copywriting with some of my own prompt engineering when coaching business students would be interested in exploring possible use cases in permaculture design, education, outreach. Yeah, totally. I actually had a, a student um, student this semester in this class, not yours, Francis, say that they were using uh, ChatGPT for some of their text. And I've been using it for report writing. Um, I usually do uh, detailed bullet points about uh, a topic and generally report writing has been my weakness. Um, I always thought if I could write quicker reports, I would be, I'd be quicker on my deliverables. Um, and so I've been doing a little bit of running it through chat GPT. Uh, I've got the 4.0 version and it's been great. I really appreciated it. I've got a couple of friends who have been trying to use chat GPT for design and they haven't been very successful. It's been good for ideation. It's been good for like how, let's talk about this idea and let's think about what this might be and let's think about plants in this area. Um, but generally hasn't been accurate, has been my experience. Uh, now, how much, like, I mean, we work with ChatGPT before, right? Because, like, I had a lot of trouble trying to get ChatGPT to remember context. Mm -hmm. Like, specifically saying, I've explored a set of context with you, with ChatGPT, and I want to, like, have a separate place where, like, these are the contexts for the next set of conversations. The last thing is to forget specific things and keeping text. So because every time, uh, it will always just kind of like research the entire world over and over mm -hmm. again, every question I type. And that's being like, so I get very generic bland answers. And that's why I kind of started paying for Jasper. It was mm -hmm. like, because uh, then it has some sort of parts you can actually put like a background section where these are background on use. And then I was able to sub in like variable being like, so in my case it would be like, this is like my, you know, the demographics, psychographics, client avatar business and stuff like variables. And I'll ask questions like write like five, uh, top five pain points for out client avatar using like the serial emotional language, like stuff yeah. like that to give me prompts. And then yeah. it got better. And then I never got the same results with GPT so far, but I haven't been paid for uh, GPT-4. So it's like, maybe I'm just not good at prompt engineering with GPT. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of things here and I just want to make sure, cause I'm, I'm happy to go over mostly because I've, I've taken a deep dive into AI, specifically the large, the large language models over the last couple of months and trying to see how they work with design and regenerative landscape design. So um, I'm happy to go into this, but I just first want to check in and see if anybody has any questions specifically about um, what's coming up for the next design assignments. Uh, if, if anybody wants me to go over those assignments, I, I already have in the past, and that's in the, the tutorial, but if anybody has a specific question about that. Any questions about the upcoming microclimate assignment or the uh, current zones? I've had a couple of questions about zones where people are like, "I'm my site's bare and I'm not doing anything on it. How do I do this? Same thing. It's just chances are if you haven't been there for a year, it's going to be a zone five. If you're going there monthly, a zone four. If you're going there uh, or a few times a year, zone four, monthly, zone uh, three, weekly, zone two. Same thing. It just means you have a shorter assignment. Your workload's a little bit easier this, this week. Going once, going twice. All right. Well, I will officially close uh, the call from that conversation. And then anybody who wants to geek out about AI and its implications for <laughs> design is willing to stay because I've I've been heavy into this for the last little while. So to Francis's point, um, talking about the ability for large language models to remember context, um, ChatGPT Chat GPT is uh, created by OpenAI is not very good at doing at it but it's very good at refreshing itself. So what I found is sometimes I will ask ChatGPT to create the prompts that it needs to remember the different elements that we're talking about. And I will hold that in a separate document or hold that on that document. So I have a couple of clients I've been working with 
and and have those elements there that I will then remind it. Generally, it'll come back to that same, excuse me, context. The other thing I did for um, a, a business design client of mine who's a, a ecological landscape developer, they're great work, award-winning, but doing it for years, uh, found themselves not having as much work as they wanted this year. So we talked a little bit about reputation building because there's three pinnacles for business from my perspective. And one of them is reputation. Are you telling people what you're doing? And so we developed a year worth of content for them to put out uh, via Instagram, Facebook, uh, building a YouTube channel, did it in a couple of hours with chat GPT, which was pretty fascinating. Um, the other applications mm. that I would say, Francis, if you want to check out, uh, if you're happy with Jasper AI and you like the price point and all the rest of it, go for it. Mm. But the other two that I've enjoyed is perplexity and Poe, P-O-E. P -O -E. Um, I'm happy okay. to just grab those off of my, uh, my little notion, um, Notion database here of all my different AI elements. So this is perplexity and then po, I think it's po.com actually. Let me just go back and check that. Po, po.com. Yeah. And the nice thing about po is you can create through po uh, different bots that are specific to the information you give them and the prompt. And basically they read that prompt every time you open up the bot. So if you do create a specific either client avatar, customer avatar, company, brand, or whatnot, then you can come back to it over and over again. It's been, okay. it's been super useful. Okay. I mean, John, I don't know how much time you got. So, but if you got like 10 more minutes, yeah. because then what I did is kind of like, I I built a science of problem engineering for like, kind of teaching my entrepreneurship students. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now I have this tool on my hand that I built. I kind of just want to figure out whether we can, do more with it in, in this context. Uh, is there a way for me to share a screen? Because I don't yeah, know how yeah, much time I got, because either I can review some of uh, the stuff that uh, you know I've, I've already done for actually my side design, or I can uh, try to do something just like fresh. Yeah, but please I, do. I'm going to make sure that uh, everyone, yeah, you can share. Good. OK. Do you see my my notion yes, <laughs> I do. thing here? OK. so. I built like a few templates for brand positioning and market research. And it's kind of, this is kind of the Jasper kind of things, but I play along a few prompts and I got some things I like or all. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if time, if we have time, I would rather like, let's pick something that we have a hypothesis. Like in my head be like, Hey, let's uh, look at uh, people that are in a certain age group that are looking to move out buy a cheap bottle mm -hmm. land and then build it up and then live on it. That could be like a possible kind of a segment, but just for the sake of time, is there a way to hide this top bar? Oh, uh, there we go. No, it's not. Uh, like something I've been through is like uh, for uh, my site context is that like being that I was building a about 126 acres and we're doing permaculture design to build like a wellness resort. And it was to try to do like the, the, the two segments are people that are urban workers that are stressed and want to, to have a relief and or just backpackers, lamping, et cetera. So I started doing some market research in this context here. So uh, put some variables here. And then this output, what I got was that uh, is pretty much like if I could just drop over here. I kind of, what I do is like, you know, type this out. So this kind of being like, hey, like say 30, 40 years, kind of a little context here, put that in the command there. And then what I kind of do here is like, cause this is kind of what I like asking to remember certain variables mm -hmm. to then build some context, let's say top five pain points and then just ask it to generate. But then like out in there using like then with human brain, pick all the things that I think are, are, are relevant mm -hmm. and then build out like a customer profile where understand what this user is. And then what I tell my students is like, you need to not tailor the client avatar for what you want to do as a business, but you need to understand this hypothetical person very specifically. Mm -hmm. And then so that they have more pain points that you can sort of solve, but you want to have that build out as like a, a a background and then put that in the background section and then use that say, hey, I'm speaking to this person. How can I communicate them in terms of my messaging, either like a business perspective where like I want to teach them, or I want to raise, like, for example, raise awareness on, certain things. So it's like when I was, you know, so I went through a lot of sustainability kind of like minded uh, students in, in my, 
when I coached entrepreneurship at University of Waterloo. And then uh, a lot of these kids are very, you know, they're very excited about making a good impact in the world, but they would just be like very furious, right? Like uh, no compromise, any plastic is evil, <laughs> all mm. sort of things. And they will go all the way to that. And like, how do I, you know, bring that conversation in being like some of the middle of row solutions are moving things in the right direction and then messaging towards that audience. And this I think has been helpful. Mm -hmm. But just as an example here, so I was able to get something like or uh, um, anxiety, insomnia for people that are, so this is like a, the avatar of like somebody who's working a stressful kind of job in the city and they would go to like a retreat to relax, et cetera. So mm -hmm. what I do is I like, kind of use this kind of stuff to build like a piece of background and then eventually, so this this avatar sort of built out. Uh, I pick some of these ones I, I, I like, I tweak the language a little bit mm -hmm. and then build up uh, the things I, I do like to put in the background is like uh, their general pain points, mm -hmm. um, some specific language that this does is in this in group so that, you know, conversations like, so then when I actually like one thing I like Jasper is like, Hey, tell me like if this person was able, was talking to their friends or family about what we we're doing, how would they say it? What kind of language would they use? And then mm -hmm. I use that to kind of pull out the keywords. And there's like, Somewhere, so there's things where I ask for, like, hey, give me the words, the jargon, the terms they use, give me the words. And when I say, like, use some language, they actually generate, like, full paragraphs, like, testimonial style, which is very interesting to me. What I do like to have is always, like, negative assumptions around people, because I, what I found is actually, this is true in business, and I think it's very true for you, too, Jeremy. It's kind of like, you're too deep in, like, the context and the knowledge of this. It's hard to see the blind spot you would if you if you were new to anything. Mm -hmm. So when I say like negative assumptions, in you know, kind of like that really brings me to process of, hey, this is something that this person will be concerned with that like I don't even see them having concerns. Mm -hmm. So that has been useful for me, at least just for my business research. But, and then there was like top concern for, this is like when you have an offering, so you have a specific kind of idea you want to promote. And then say, hey, given this context, I kind of copy paste, uh, I say, let me just do that right now. Just do it live. Like, let's say these are the, you know, the pain points and these are the negative assumptions. I put that in the background. And I kind of just next ask like, hey, what are, um, give me detailed objections that they would plan to do this. Uh, they, would, they would object against the offer. But like what I, time if time allows, I like to go full on, like figure out like what are their, what have they tried to do themselves to try to get to the current state, like a uh, status quo to achieving a certain goal? Mm -hmm. And what have they tried, what have they failed, what has been the pain points there? And then really try to build up a bit of a of an avatar there and then figure out how to talk to these people. And then what I do like also is like, the FAQs are also very interesting for me. Because then sometimes like, uh, you'll give you the, the questions these people have for anything that you're trying to provide, and then the AI will also answer for you on what they want to hear. And sometimes I see like, oh, it's like, oh, I don't do that. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. I, I'll see the output be like, okay, we, we got to address this, but probably in a different way. And mm -hmm. I will say the fine stuff about my business. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of permaculture, I haven't applied some sort of this uh, prompt engineering memory kind of like background to, uh, I imagine it would be like good to say, hey, he, these are, the things I'm wanting in my garden, remember these, and then, you know, and then these are the rainfalls in my area, remember this, and then say like, what are some plant patterns, some, mm -hmm. you know, like combination of planting guilds I can explore. I've never tr not tried with this stuff, but I can see that happening, but definitely in terms of like, I can see educational outreach kind of thing, mm -hmm. but that's a lot to content writing again. So, but I do like, I tried this for my own businesses. I do like it for now and just kind of figure out how, maybe there's something to do, you know, to, to, to promote like the, the message. Cause I think like, uh, right. one of the things could be like, I don't know how many people would turn their backyards into like an edible garden, mm -hmm. but even that, right. Like some, some sort of piece on that. Mm -hmm. But that, that's kind of the, the, the tool that I've kind of built over time. And this is kind of what I've been working on the AI. So I'm not sure. Cause I don't know what you have done in GPT four, but this is I like this so far just because like the ability mm -hmm. to specifically define the background and, and force the AI to use that 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. No, this is something that I've done a few times with clients, specifically talking about pain points and gain points. Um, Individuals who are starting a business, starting a design business, and how can they start to speak or find a vocabulary that will produce uh, uh, a marketable content so that we folks can get a sense of what they're doing. I think uh, I think I just saw a six eight nine throw a, a question in the chat there. You know, what does this have to do with permaculture? Um, and what I appreciate about AI, at least in this iteration, is that it has the ability to ID ideate, and it has the ability to be asked questions that can help prompt us. It, it needs to be always verified and questioned in terms of what the output is, which I think you've done a great job of. But it also helps in terms of then coming up with who might, if you are creating a site like you are, that's a resort that's trying to bring people into and, and connect with us. How can we then advertise to the right people, bring them in and make sure that you have an economic engine to to support that site and build it even further? So yeah, great work, Francis. Thanks for sharing this. Uh, but okay. I mean, thank you. But it was just wanted to ask so like, have you had any successful cases or people talk to where they actually tried to use AI to like define the parameters for a site design and then ask and then have it generate something actually meaningful to bring it back to permaculture, right? <laughs> like yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. So yeah, I've done this several times. Um, and unfortunately, it doesn't have the context or it doesn't have the data to pull from in terms of um in terms of climate, in terms of soil. You know, all of those elements aren't necessarily available. So it hasn't been able to take in those with a number of parameters about what to do and what not to do to actually create okay. a good design yet. I have seen ideation for plants where it's, we're in this area, we're curious about these things. What kind of plants would you suggest? And maybe there's three or four good suggestions in there, but unless you have that that experience to discern between them, you wouldn't be able to get to uh, a solid answer yet. I'm sure there's somebody at this point who's seen this and is working on the problem and is trying to create like a permaculture bot that if you put in, you know, all of these variables that we have, Geiger climate, soil type, climate type, you know, what's the plant list? And I'm sure that'll come out eventually. That's just- Okay, because that's kind of almost what I was kind of trying to ask if somebody has success with that. Because I imagine it's like, hey, he doesn't know the context about what if it, we told it the context, being like, hey, remember the soil is this and that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but I was just wondering, like, from experience, if like, at that point, you have all the information, you would just already know what to do <laughs> versus like yeah. needing AI for anything at that point, because they already did all the, you already got all kind of the pieces going yeah, and I think the thing to remember is uh, it's it's good with ideation. It's good at giving answers. Sometimes it hallucinates and doesn't give accurate answers, uh, especially when you're acting for, asking for facts. If you're asking for subjective answers like uh, market avatars, mm-hmm. you could you could go back and forth and question it and say, well, it's pretty much right or it's pretty much there. Or for students that are feeling the friction of actually generating answers, it would get them over that hump, right? The problem becomes when there's so many details. And actually, I think I'm just seeing somebody. Yeah, right. This here. Yes, Sam just wrote it. Yeah. The trouble is how many details. Um, And also it needs a a little bit of trained learning. So if somebody ended up training an AI on its process and details and conversations, you could get to something that could help generate probably a rough draft that then you would you would tune uh, to Mm -hmm. something and build pretty quickly. Um, I, I see that completely possible. The problem is once you put it in the ground. So currently large language models or the AI we currently have don't have a sense of all the many faceted, many facets of ecology. So if one variable change, what happens to everything else? This is still very much, you know, the, the realm of ecologists and biologists and, and most of the life sciences, we still don't have that understanding. So that would be hard to program into if we get to, you know, if we get to, um, um, if we get to that that state where AI is at the human mind and then AI is at the 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 capacity of of humanity at large, maybe there'll be a novel invention that'll happen there. But at this point, no. Uh, all of my experiences of trying to get it to um, take a design or take a conversation or what to do, there's just too many variables. I take a look at this design I just finished. And it it took us being on the land and walking the land and looking at it to go, okay, the place where we thought the pond should go is not the most ideal spot. 
And that's mm. because as usual, the map isn't the territory. And st- until you walk the territory with experienced eyes, you're never going to know exactly what it is. It's always going to be a little bit obscure. So I feel like, so it sounds like, you know, like at this current iteration, most of all these, like any of these output would be, how do I say, almost too cookie cutter. It's trying to do the same thing in, yeah. in ignoring local context. Yeah. It's kind of almost like, hey, let's do a, like a standard building with this many amenities. Make sure there's always a pond. Make sure there's always a garden. Make sure there's always a orchard. And then they kind of just try to make everything fit. But <laughs> It doesn't like, make any sense. Like a couple of designers I know, actually, as you're saying this. Um, yeah, it it happens that way. And there isn't that responsiveness to what's in front of you. And this is why, for me, I always start with values-based decision-making to understand who are the clients, what do they want to be true about their state of being with the site? And then that helps to evaluate or filter what potentially they might do. They may want to become a farmer, but do they want to become a chicken farmer or a fowl farmer? And if so, do they want to become a chicken farmer? And if they're running chickens, what is the speciation that would be best for them as a person? So as Sam so so detail uh, so perfectly put it, the details is needed for proper context. You need to know the person, their place, their history, what they're thinking, what's what's going on with them. And if Yuval Harari is correct and we are hackable humans and everything we know can be understood, that might be there in the future. I just don't think it's around the corner. It, 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 okay. it'll, we'll eventually get there if we go this way with AI. Like it'll just, it'll continue with Moore's law until it'll happen. So, like there'll be that moment. But right now there hasn't been a lot of success from what I've seen coming out of it. Okay. And it sounds like there's almost a problem of making things too processized so that mm-hmm. you kind of lose the, uh, I guess, the art side of this. Well, you you lose the ecology of it right? Because ecology is always going to be site-specific and multifaceted in terms of understanding what it's doing, how it's doing. We were on a site the other day and uh, we came onto the site and there was this big drainage and a road had been cut through the drainage to get to the house, uh, effectively cutting off the drainage. So they then routed that drainage someplace else, which then left Mm. this beautiful bowl, beautiful sun bowl for the seep water that was coming through to feed a bunch of ocean spray. Um, and there's ocean spray above the road and there's ocean spray below the road, but below the road, the ocean spray is all in this very interesting bubble uh, configuration. And you look at it and it takes you a moment to go, the deer are loving the ocean spray and they're completely, they're completely eating up and getting, it's perfectly for like a deer's arc of its neck and how it's moving over this ocean spray. And there are all these little pruned ocean spray you know, balls, bubbles that are coming off of the ground. But that sort of innovative moment of looking at that and understanding that, uh, I think we're a a long way off. Awesome. Thanks for bringing up the conversation. And thanks for showing me that process. That's brilliant. Um, Yeah, I've I've done that a few times with clients and it's been super fun to, you know, ideate and bring up some good ideas. So yeah, thanks. And uh, thanks to Sam and uh, and Janet for staying staying late with us and having a little bit of an AI chat. That's fun. <laughs> All right, folks, we'll see you in two weeks time. Francis, I may see you next week for our final week, session. Yeah. Who knows? And uh, take care, everybody. Thank you.